Good morning. Um, <clears throat> we had a good, great dinner yesterday and uh, obviously some mandatory dinner drinks, so glad to see you guys showing up. Um, we have the way too long title for this presentation, but once we get into the details, we'll figure out what it actually means. But um, before we dwell into the details about the case, I thought that uh, maybe, maybe we'll check a little bit of background first. So <clears throat> basically, I'm a gamer guy. Uh, I've, I've had the luxury of being born in the early 80s, uh, which means that uh, I, I have been one of those fortunate kids who played through basically all the life cycles of the different game consoles. I had PCs before, before uh, we even had like more than two colors on screen and stuff like that. So uh, I've always been passionate about not just games from a consumer point of view, but first and foremost, how are those things made? Like what, what actually ticks under the hood and uh, what makes a game what it is? And um, basically, <clears throat> ever since I was a kid, I've been trying to somehow break and modify those game experiences, which then uh, after a couple of iterations turned into making some mods for existing games and stuff like that, and uh, writing some old own game designs. and. Uh, Pretty soon I realized that I had a, like a bucket of projects which never got finished and so on and very soon realized that on, on your own there's not much you can do about it so you really need a team to do it. Uh, and then after a couple of iterations in, in 2007 we founded this company called Nitro Games and started, started making games in a professional manner. Um, and um, <clears throat> basically to give a little bit of background to the presentation, uh, with Nitro Games, as of today, we are close to 60 people uh, in Finland in two studios. And uh, basically the background that we have with this team is that uh, we started uh, in early days in making relatively hardcore games. We, we worked a lot on PC, we did PC strategy games. Our first ever global launch was a game called East India Company, which was like a strategy game uh, where you managed your own trading companies and then you fought naval battles in, in glorious 3D and that was also our first experiment in creating game engines on our own and uh, the technology side of things. Uh, as a first game back in the day it was relatively successful. I think East India Company has sold more than 300,000 copies to date which back in the day when you still shipped the games in a boxes and it was a niche PC game it was, it was pretty good. Uh, but obviously we've learned a thing or two uh, uh, since those days. But one thing that throughout those early years that we learned when we worked a lot on PC and we did some console stuff as well was that uh, uh, it really isn't that much possible to grow a too big of a team in, in Finland uh, for a couple of reasons. Typically the uh, Finland as a country is not that big. It's not exactly the sexiest place on earth because most of the time of the year it's dark and dull and cold and, and nobody wants to be in an environment like that. But also it's a relatively uh, high cost country so, so the salaries and everything are, are pretty high typically. So we had to find our ways around that fact and, and, and learn how to operate with relatively small teams compared to some console game productions where you had hundreds of people working on a single game and so on. Um, last five years we've been focusing exclusively on mobile and, uh, and we've been focusing on this awesome thing called free to play. And uh, during those five years uh, what, what we've done is that uh, uh, we've essentially all the time kept our initial focus which was on making games for gamers. So what actually Victor was talking about in the opening words that he said about that it's all about the game and you should always focus on the gamer. Uh, that's essentially what we've done throughout all the times. We've never really went after any, any market trend or any, any hype thing or changed the course in that, that we are big believers in the fact that First and foremost, we ourselves are the customer for our games because we are gamers and these are the type of games that we would want to play and that gives us a perfect, perfect balance there. And um, during our five years on mobile so far, uh, what we've developed is our own technology we call Nitro Games Platform. Uh, I'm very much not a technical guy in that sense, but uh, basically what that is, it's a modular game engine that we built on top of Unity 3D. That's a baseline that we use in, in our mobile games. 
And with, with Nitro Games platform, what we can do is basically we build our games from a certain type of modules, which makes it easy and fast for us to do prototyping and uh, do different uh, configurations for different games and uh, take certain feature sets or, or things from one game to another and uh, speed up the process of development. And basically it gives us more time to focus on what's essential and that's the user experience. And um, together with Nitro Games platform, we, we call our way of working MVP process, uh, which basically means that uh, uh, our process is all about getting stuff on screen the fastest possible way. And why that's important in general is that we feel that it all boils down to the consumer experience. And especially in mobile, it's such an important thing. So the whole way of working and the pipelines and the technology is built around the fact that we need to get stuff on screen as fast as possible. Um, as part of the MVP process, we typically not just do testing on our own, but do focus group testings. And sometimes we, we launch things on selected markets under some fake names and fake labels super early just to get some data and feedback from, from real life customers as well. So that's the background where we come from. And uh, <clears throat> the topic of today is a game called Runegate Heroes. Uh, and actually not that much about the game, but uh, how we actually did it. Uh, this is a project that uh, we've had the pleasure of working together with, with Wargaming. Uh, it is a game where basically Wargaming owns the game and uh, provides the funding to the project. Uh, they also act as the project lead. And uh, as, as things have now progressed forward in the production, already take care of the publishing side of things. The role of Nitro Games has been first and foremost to act as the developer. Uh, we've also provided a lot of existing tech into the project, both on the client side and on the server side. And uh, as things move forward, we're also very much uh, taking care of the maintenance and uh, the servicing of the game in the live stage. Um, but to give a little bit of context to the presentation, what Runegate Heroes is, it's basically a free to play mobile game, which looks like a MOBA, but it essentially is not. It's a relatively straightforward strategy game. Uh, basically, in this game, you have two players playing against each other in real time. Uh, both of them spawn these MOBA game style heroes to the battlefield, which then take off those towers that you see in MOBA games and uh, fight the enemies. And uh, the trick here is that it's not like a team versus team, but just one player versus one player, a couple of minutes of battles and uh, huge fun. And then obviously the whole collection and upgrading of those hero characters. So relatively straightforward uh, mobile free to play game, something where you take things and puzzle pieces from PC and you bring them on mobile and introduce them in a touch native format and also from mobile game friendly sessions point of view. Um, <clears throat> where we're going with this thing is that um, we've been working on, on this project now more or less close to two years. Uh, how it all started was actually in, in 2016 when uh, Wargaming had produced like a, a prototype for the game, uh, basically a paper prototype on screen, like not, not, not focusing on graphics or anything, but just the core idea of the game. And uh, at that point, we, we got involved and uh, we pro provided them with a pitch on, on, on how we would take the game forward and, and how, we could, how we could turn it into flesh and how we would envision the end product based on the initial pitch and so on. And uh, obviously somebody somewhere liked that because things started rolling and uh, we, we went forward with the, with the project. And, um, these production stages that we have here, or development phases, however you want to call them, uh, basically what we did first is that we went into this thing called pre-production. Uh, that lasted for a couple of months. And once we were through that, then again, you know, evaluation gates and do we want to move forward with this? Then we went into the production, which is where the heavy lifting typically happens. And after that, we are now in, in, in soft launch on, on selected markets. Uh, we will deep dive more into those production phases and what actually happens and happened during those later on in this presentation. Before we go into details, uh, I think I wanted to highlight 
uh, two key things that I think are critical, not just in this project, but in any game project, uh, especially if you operate in a, in a manner where how, how we operate. So you have relatively small teams, which are more or less in one location. In our case, in two locations, but still close by to each other. Uh, one is that like you need to have faith uh, the whole time. I think that's essential, especially the longer and bigger the production is, the more important this becomes. Um, with faith, I mean that in the beginning, when a game idea is born or a game project starts, there's always some high level idea that why this game needs to be made in the first place. And um, very often uh, in game projects, not just what we've seen inside Nitro Games, but also, also what we've seen in other companies is that that idea somewhere starts to get lost as things get complicated. More and more people get involved and things get more and more technical. There's some changes happening on the market or whatever. But uh, that's something that we are big believers in that if there's a thing that we believed in in day one, let's make sure that we maintain that faith into that something throughout the whole process. And um, our way of doing it is basically repeating it. Simple as that. Because uh, we humans are simple animals in that sense that if we repeat something to each other all the time, we, we start actually believing that something. And that's been the mentality there that uh, if, if something was strong enough for us to believe in in the first place, let's keep repeating to each other. And therefore we are able to keep the faith as we move through the challenges of game development. And uh, the second one is actually, I think, even more important, which is simply have fun. Like uh, whether it's the development team or, or in, in the picture on the right, there's one guy from Wargaming, Dmitri Yudo, who was on the other side, uh, uh, our project lead, Simo Sylkren, and then, then me, uh, probably just showing up to pay the bill. Uh, but you need to have fun, because if you're not having fun, suddenly, things might get complicated because uh, we, we do want to be in a position where whatever we do, we enjoy what we're doing. And when we are enjoying what we're doing, we're producing good results. And uh, the more complicated the development or the process becomes, the more important this thing actually becomes. So in addition to making sure that whatever was the thing why this project started in the first place and keeping that flame alive, we need to make sure that we're enjoying working with each other. And only that way we believe that you can produce good results. So therefore, having activities outside the typical development activities is also super crucial in a process like this. Um, <clears throat> let's then look a little bit uh, more into details on how we, how we set up the project and how it was actually managed. Um, on a nutshell, uh, the whole setup that we, we built for RuneGate Heroes was uh, something that we wanted it to be lean and agile, and uh, that against, the, or not against, but taking into account the setup that we had, which was that essentially we had Wargaming acting as a customer for us and us acting as a developer providing that project to them, which of course means that there's agreements with, with, with milestones and criteria, what needs to be in them and so on. But we still wanted the whole process of cooperation to be as, as agile as possible. So basically, some beautiful things about this project compared to so many others that we've done in the past is that things were really straightforward. We always had one guy on our end and one guy on the wargaming side who were the main contact points. Uh, the more people there's involved in the contact on, on both sides, the more complicated things start to get and the more room there is for mistakes in the communication. So we wanted to be dead clear about that from the get go that there's one guy on both sides who know everything and uh, they are the main, main contact points. And that is something that we maintain throughout the whole process. Um, the second thing is that whatever the project management tools are, whatever the setup is where, where people see what's going on, uh, everybody needs to have real, real time access to that. I think nowadays things like this go, go, go without saying. So we just wanted to set up an environment where we don't need to communicate that much into what's going on because everybody has access to the same thing all the time. But then about the topic of the speech, which is about continuous delivery process. Uh, one of the key things was to set up the process of producing the game in a way that we could have continuous deliverables. I think 
that's key, especially in, in a mobile game where the development cycles are relatively fast and there's uh, quite a lot of stuff happening in each, each milestone. And um, <coughs> we will talk a little bit more about why, why and how we built this uh, moving forward. But basically the idea here is that both sides need to see at all times what we actually have on screen. And that's important because in the end of the day, all that matters is the consumer experience. So everything that we do, we need to keep our heads cool that we're not just executing a product plan, sorry, a production plan, but what we're actually doing is a game for customers who are gamers. So therefore we need to have constant access to the game that the customers are about to experience. And that was the whole mindset, how this was built. Then the last three points are basically about how to make sure that we keep the faith and have fun. So daily communication going on, uh, frequent visits, uh, both directions, and uh, dedicated key staff who doesn't move around too much, but stick with the project. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things I think that help with all this is that you do a lot of these things. Uh, that's our chairman and that's uh, the representative from the Wargaming, so Dmitri. And uh, these things are important that people who work on the project, they join, that's one of our greatest parties after, after a summer uh, holidays, I think last year or something. But that people join these things and why it's important to join these things is to repeat the thing. Why are we in this process? How is the game coming along? Everybody knows the details, what's going on in the project management and tasks and milestones and yada, yada, yada. But it's important to discuss at all times, where are we going? How is it progressing? What are the points that we feel we're doing well? Where do we see the improvement areas? Just so that everybody's on the same page. And this in the end of the day then results into everybody having fun while they're doing the thing as well. Um, <clears throat> some technical jargon coming up. Uh, we thought we wanted to share that what tools we actually used, but uh, basically with this project, uh, the mindset in the very beginning was that we should avoid having a single tool or a process in place just for the sake of having tools and processes in place. Everything that is there uh, needs to be supported by some actual meaning. So therefore, for example, for the project management and, and distribution of tasks and so on, we had relatively lightweight solution by using Asana, which is typically something that works for small teams and small projects, which are relatively simple. Um, turns out that for this one, it was just the perfect tool. Um, then uh, for, for the sake of making sure that we have continuous deliveries, we obviously had automated builds uh, going on all the time. So whenever something was happening, there's always a build available so that at all times it's possible to test what is the consumer experience like. And um, <coughs> Basically, uh, since it's a real-time, synchronous, multiplayer game on mobile, uh, the server side of things is Im important to build in a fashion from the get-go that it's uh, scalable and, uh, and that it works. Uh, in here, this was something where also we had uh, folks from Wargaming side uh, doing some technical due diligence into our server setup and uh, going through how we how we built the systems even before even before we started working on them heavily but basically uh in terms of how to get the thing running and and to ensure that everybody is actually focusing in delivering on the project we wanted to keep the tool selection as simple and straightforward as possible let's use all the simple and straightforward to use tools to keep things flowing um <clears throat> then i think this is one of the key parts here in the in the process. So how we ensure that what we're doing actually delivers on the thing that was defined as the thing uh, on the first date. So the milestones, how we built this project, uh, they were more or less one month-ish, sometimes maybe a little less, sometimes a little more, but roughly one month milestones. And um, all of those milestones throughout all the phases of the project basically went through the same cycle. So we start everything face to face. That's when we go through, okay, what is going to be in the next upcoming milestone? How does it look like? What is the point of the upcoming milestone? What do we want to achieve? How does it look from tasks point of view? What, what's going to be there? Who's going to be working on what and, and all these things. But um, in addition to basically 
laying down the contents of that and making necessary modifications or whatever. Uh, key thing is to focus on the expectations. What do we expect to gain with this milestone and how do we then measure that in the end? Or how do we define in the end that did we actually read something or not? Uh, especially in a production like this, which at least to us is relatively long, uh, it's super important to make sure that you deliver something with a meaning instead of just focusing on clearing the task list and once it's empty then we have a milestone and then we deliver because that that happens very easily unless you keep your mind really open into that what is the purpose of this milestone that we're creating then <clears throat> once things have been agreed it's actually more or less straightforward during the development phase of the milestone then project managers just do the daily communications and uh, make sure that things are checked there's typically always something that doesn't go exactly as planned. Something requires either more resources or more time or something doesn't exactly turn out as it was expected to turn out and then some steering is required inside the milestone. But those are the typical things. Uh, but the key thing happening in the project management is, uh, is often preparing for the next one. So this one is now underway. It looks like it's shaping up like this. How do we, how do we prepare for the next one? And then every milestone that we did, uh, we would then submit to Wargaming because, again, they are the owner of the project and uh, they, they basically green-lighted uh, every milestone and, and did the approval. And uh, for that purpose, we, we obviously put the milestones through QA, both internal QA at Nitro Games Plus, then we used some external partners for that one as well. But then again, after this development and submission, the important things that happened uh, is that again a face-to-face -face meeting so once we've done that monthly stint then again key people get together look each other into the eyes and uh, see that are we where we are supposed to be if not why is there something that we need to fix something we need to change how does the team setup look like are we still cool with the plan and these are the important moments where i think the magic either does happen or doesn't happen so at that point uh we need to we need to again return to the topic that on day one we started this project because of we believe in this thing. Is that this thing still existing here in the game? And then, then we see that, okay, this is how the roadmap forward looks like. How do we want to modify it? How do we want to adjust the next milestone to ensure that we're actually getting into the end goal where we want to be? Um, <clears throat> this process basically repeated itself uh, throughout the project. So let's have a look see at the project phases, like how we how we basically built this one. So at first, uh, once our uh, involvement in the project started, we went into pre-production. <coughs> Excuse me. Which is your, I guess, typical pre-production, which basically means that in the end you produce something that's more or less a vertical slice uh, describing how the end product is going to be, plus tons of documentations technical design documents, art design documents, game design documents, describing basically the whole, whole shebang. And um, this one, uh, the whole mindset was that we want to get something that looks as final as it simply makes sense. Something that from gameplay experience point of view is something that we can, we can really test and we can see, see whether it actually works. Uh, so it shouldn't look anything too much of a work in progress. Uh, but still we wanted to keep the team really small to both avoid spending too much money, but, but also like ensuring that it stays lean, because at this point you are still open for making adjustments to the project if you need to and if you want to. So basically the pre-production was three milestones each roughly a month, Plus, then we did uh, one so-called market test milestone where we put the game out with a fake name and uh, through a fake label publisher and uh, got some users into it and got some initial data to make sure that we, we know where we stand with the game. And um, after this, we basically did something which uh, uh, you don't necessarily always do, is, but we continued the production uh, with the same code base. Uh, it did require some refactoring here and there, but basically we took the same code base that we had developed in the pre-production and moved into production stage. And um, this production stage was <coughs> close to one year. Uh, and this is where all the heavy lifting and the mass production happened. And uh, in, in this one, 
basically uh, the team composition uh, more or less doubled, uh, but also like uh, uh, changed in, in shape. So in, in the production, I think the biggest thing to produce was everything related to art. There's so many, so many characters in the game, so many animations, effects, levels, whatever, UI elements and so on. So the team was very art heavy. And um, basically <coughs> the end result of this soft launch is obviously, sorry, end result of this production is obviously something that's good to go for a soft launch. So at this point uh, we developed the, the game uh, as you typically typically see in a game development phase and uh, what, what we de delivered in the end was a version that was then uh, subject for war gaming's approval whether they want to take it to soft launch or not. Uh, positively they wanted to, so then we moved into the soft launch stage. And this is a stage that we started in, in May this year. Uh, we are in this soft launch phase at the moment. And uh, <coughs> what happens now during this mode is that this is when things actually got more complicated. So there is a little bit more people than there was in the production phase. Uh, there's still some game development going on, producing some not secondary features, but features that uh, uh, were not needed in order to start the soft launch. But first and foremost, focusing on the market positioning of the game, building the whole user acquisition funnel to the game, going through the whole whole user life cycle. Like, like we spoke in the beginning, it all boils down to making games for gamers. So now a whole new element comes to the mix, and that's how does the life cycle of a user look like from seeing the first ad or, or finding their way into the store and going through that whole funnel. How does the first time user experience look like the day one? How do the users progress to day seven and day 30 and so on? So that means that there's a lot more to think about in general, which means that there needs to be a lot more people involved looking into data on different points. And especially what's super critical in this stage is that uh, how to make conclusions because <clears throat> what we've seen seen with this project and basically what we have seen with any other free to play mobile game project as well is that when you have such a lot of different dynamics and you have insane amounts of data from different sources it's sometimes really difficult to keep your head cool and uh, really understand that what's happening there behind all that data because some data might be pointing this direction other data might be pointing that direction and then then consumer feedback might be pointing the third direction so this is typically a moment where you need to go through a lot of, lot of uh, painstaking conclusions and really make sure that you have more people involved, but still those key people who have been there from the beginning and who created the user experience really understand what this all means to make the right conclusions. And um, once this process is over, then obviously what it produces is a launch co candidate, assuming that the soft launch succe succeeds and produces good enough results, then that's obviously the next step there. And uh, <clears throat> from our point of view, how's the next stuff looking like uh, when we're in the soft launch? These are some of the uh, uh, store assets that we have been working on. So basically, uh, the focus right now is not just in, in, in finalizing the game and making the game the best it can be, but finalizing the whole whole funnel and thinking about the messaging and finding the right audiences and uh, going through all the different phases of, of, of testing that if we position the game like this on the market and we target these type of users with these type of creatives and build the store page in a this way, this is how the audience looks like when they land in the game. Are they enjoying that? What if we target this other type of audience with a little bit different message, then how does that translate? So basically at this point, everything now suddenly turns into numbers. And uh, the, the thing there is that behind those numbers, there's always players, consumers. So we really need to understand why those players are producing the numbers that they are, and, and that way get the whole puzzle piece together. So <coughs> moving forward uh, as a sort of summary how we've, how we've done this and uh, what, what things we found essential in, in this whole, whole process is that uh, uh, there's a couple of key findings. Uh, one is that like when, when you start, uh, you should have as small team as possible. Uh, 
we, especially in Finland, we're big believers in small teams, but you, you need to minimize the amount of people because the more people you have, the more complicated things are going to get, the more opinions there's going to be on the table. And uh, at this point, you just need a strong vision. Then once you have that strong vision, then, then you need to make sure that you can execute on that vision. And uh, <clears throat> that's again where the keeping the faith comes to play. You need to make sure that every new single person that joins the project, you need to brainwash them to buy that vision. And you need to make sure that they, they share the same vision. And uh, second thing is that, uh, at least from our point of view, uh, we don't feel comfortable going into a project like this and then rebuilding everything from scratch. I think the only way for us that how we have managed to deliver on the project has been the fact that we have used technology that we have already worked on on other titles in the past. We have used processes that we have used on other productions in the past. So I think that's something that if you want to build a project in a way that you continuously deliver something on screen and everything is uh, up and running on screen all the time, uh, you better have experience from the past how you build it, because if you would have started building all the technology as you built the game, then none of this would have been possible. So that's been one of the key things. And then third, uh, which applies to free to play, especially in my opinion, is that you need to be able to adjust as you go. So in the beginning, it's important that you have that grand vision. It's important that you have plans like game design documents or, or production plans and milestone plans and so on. But in the end of the day, you need to keep strong vision on the initial uh, thinking that these plans are there to help me to reach that vision that we're after. Uh, the purpose of these plans is not to become my boss so that I actually start serving those plans and forget all about the vision because that's when you very easily go wrong. So always keep the mindset on the vision, what it is that you're after and modify the plans as you go forward and uh, make them suit uh, your way forward. And uh, <clears throat> with Keep It Lean, uh, what we basically mean is that uh, we don't believe too much in heavy hierarchy in, in game development. We believe in the fact that there's a bunch of professionals who supposedly know what they're doing, and those people put together whatever their titles are, whatever their roles are, uh -huh, put them together and uh, communicate actively, preferably face to face. That's how you get the most out of the team and that's how you get the most out of the people. And that helps with the fifth point, which is the most important uh, here that we have spoken, that you maintain that vision and you have fun while you're doing so. And we feel that that way you're able to go through a project like this and deliver on a continuous basis without going into too much of the loopholes that might be there on the way. All right, those. That's all. Any questions? Thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, who operates your backend? Sorry? Uh, your backend. Backend. Who operate? You oh. or Wiggy? We do. We do. Uh, are your developers have access to product uh, backend or not? Yes. Or yes. Oh, thank you. Hi. Um, you mentioned uh, briefly you had like a dev server, a daily server, a staging, and a live. Yeah. So for the for the daily server. Like, what was that used for? Did you like, you know, test the game every day? And how did you make sure that the, the daily build was a good build and wasn't, you know, horribly broken or, you know, incomplete features? Was there anything you did to sort of make that a good daily build? Uh, yeah, so basically the purpose of the daily builds was two things that uh, when you had those automated builds going on uh, all the time, so whenever somebody committed anything, it, it went into the automated build, so you could grab a build. And of course, sometimes stuff breaks and doesn't work. Uh, but that's why that's why you have those uh, daily build gates where the project manager actually goes through that this is the sort of version of today and make sure that the, there is a healthy version from each day. And since all those versions are available there, that you can you can get them. Uh, that helps to make sure that uh, whenever 
you are either in the beginning of the milestone or towards the end of the milestone or at whatever point, there's always a daily version that's more or less functioning. Uh, it's pretty often that you see that some things might be somewhat uh, not working as intended, and that's why you have those milestone builds that then go through QA and stuff, but they're good enough for the purpose of seeing that, okay, this is how the game looks like right now. Um, and just sort of a follow on on that, like your automated testing, like how deep was that? Was it just launch the game? Does it crash? No, or did you like have like automated, okay, select this hero, run through it? Like what were those automated tests? Uh, there wasn't too much uh, automated testing in, in a sense of like um, uh, going through those type of scenarios. That's stuff that we did more or less manually. So we had the QA uh, basically working all the time doing the sort of ongoing testing. So whenever somebody committed something new, our QA took the you know tickets and, and tested that that something works. Uh, then when Ever there was a time to build the milestones and get them into submission shape, then we typically go through a two-stage QA where we first sort of, uh, we call it like development QA. We, we make sure that what we're delivering is, is working and that's typically done by some QA folks and the development team. But after that, there's a second phase, which we call like publishing QA, which then makes sure that it operates on all the devices and what your publisher would typically go through, like checklists. Anything else? Hi, you see. I'm Peter Hi. from AppAgent. Thanks a lot for a great talk. I have a question regarding analytics. You have shown on the slide that it's handled by Wargaming. Does it mean that the infrastructure is handled by them, or are they also analyzing the data, or is it someone from your team, and then who makes the final conclusions, uh, which uh, should be you know, managed by a game designer who then makes some adjustments of the game? Is it, again, on Nitro game side, or wargaming, or do you have to come to some conclusion together? Uh, basically, it's uh, technically wargaming who acts as a publisher uh, who goes through the data. And uh, but but in real life, like both of the parties have access to the data because it's impossible to develop or maintain or optimize a free-to-play game without seeing the data. So obviously that needs to be there. Uh, in terms of uh, conclusions, again, since it's wargaming product, end of the day they have the final say on whatever the topic. So that's obviously, and that's good because that's always clear. But again, in practice, uh, all the things that we found good in this process are something that there's like that constant dialogue going on on a daily basis. Both parties are looking at the data. There's people on the both sides looking at, okay, how should we read this? What should we conclude out of this set? Uh, sometimes people point blank agree that, okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense, and then we do it like this. Or sometimes people might disagree that, hey, we think that this means this. No, 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 we think that this means that. Then it might require some further testing and so on. But I think it's super important that whenever you work on free to play, as soon as you have any data, everybody in the team has access to that. Otherwise, people can't do their jobs. That's just the way it is. Kitos. Ah, thanks. Hello, Jan from uh, About Fun. I would like to ask you, you showed us a slide with your um, milestone like cy mi milestone cycle. How, yeah. uh, how did you change it when you entered soft launch? Do, do you, did you inter integrate the feedback and bugs from, basic, from production into your milestone, milestone that you're doing right now? Or are you just integrated it, integrating it into next milestones along? Uh, that's part of the... Uh, sort of uh, both the post-mortem phase of the previous milestone, but especially the more or less ongoing planning of the upcoming milestone. So obviously, as soon as you get any data, even during the production, if there was some gameplay testing and things like that, uh, those are things that you want to take into account on, on the fly. So um, sometimes even, uh, especially in the soft launch stage, you might see something that even encourages you to modify the ongoing milestone. That's why you want to have a super lean setup that you have a prioritized backlog of items that you want to put in, but of course, whenever you get something from data, it needs to be prioritized accordingly. Sometimes it might be more urgent, sometimes less urgent. So I think that's something where the project managers just need to have the understanding that what I'm seeing here, is this something we should react to right now in the next milestone or put it into the backlog of things that might potentially maybe happen someday? So your milestones aren't locked in terms of content, it's more yeah, deadlines? Yeah, they're, they're, they're locked on a high level. There's like a 
things that are we have agreed that we will deliver in each milestone. Uh, typically, I would say probably 90% of the things that you receive data or feedback uh, doesn't affect those. So you're, you can manage to do those things without affecting the contents. Uh, but for example, in some cases it might be that the milestone deliverable list doesn't make sense anymore for whatever the reason, or it turns out that it's not feasible anymore, or whatever the things are, then you simply need to need to agree with the other party that, okay, how about we modify or change this like this, and then you modify the plan. Because in the end of the day, it's all about, you had that vision in day one that what this game is about, and that's what you are working towards. Thank you. Thanks. Could you have delivered the project with the same quality in a shorter amount of time? And if so, how? Um, I don't think so, to be honest. Uh, probably, yeah, if we now would do it for a second time so we would know all the learnings, then, then of course, yes, we would be able to do it a lot faster. But um, I, don't, I don't think so because uh, uh, in the end of the day, um, the project like this is basically something where uh, the high-level idea and the core design is super clear from day one because it's not the most complicated game out there. But all the little details and tweaks that really separate like a super great product from something that's just nice. Uh, those are things that need to happen during development and those are things that you never really can foresee, in my opinion, that well, you just need to make sure that you have the people and you have the time to tackle those as they come. So I would say no. Thank you for your speech. Uh, I have a question about, uh, it was a list of technologies and tools on one of your slides yeah. of, in, in your presentation. Uh, how did you make a decision of using the certain tool uh, for your project? Um, basically, that was surprisingly straightforward. Uh, we, we proposed that we are comfortable with working these type of tools to Wargaming. Wargaming said that we need to meet these and these requirements and we prefer these and these type of tools. Then when there's not a conflict, things are easy that, okay, let's agree we said it this way. If there is a conflict, then we need to see that which of the op options is really better. Mm -hmm. But like none of those, how to say it, technical things really were difficult here because I think one of the greatest things in our collaboration with Wargaming is the lack of bullshit with anything. There was never really any politics involved with any of those decisions and it was all just done from the point of view that what makes the most sense for the project. So all of those things were actually really straightforward. You have somebody who prefers something and other party who prefers something and then you throw the arguments on the table and then you just see what's best for the project and you go with that. Mm -hmm. Have you invested some time for education, team education, for the tools, for example? Uh, in this project, very little, uh, practically none. Uh, mm -hmm. some, some new employees that joined during the project, yes. Uh, but, but those tools that we've used are, are something that we've used in like previous projects in, in Nitro Games, more or less. So there was very little educational things mm -hmm. going on. Plus the fact that the tools were pretty straightforward, like everybody knows how to use Google Docs nowadays. Uh, Asana is something that if you haven't really used it, you spend half an hour with it and you're comfortable using it. So that was one of the things that we did not want to create an infrastructure where any people would need to spend a long time learning how to do, because the project management and task management is supposed to be there to help you to make you do your job faster and not become your daily task of actually managing your tasks. Mm -hmm. and, and one more small question about uh, tooling for project management. Uh, why it, was, it wasn't Jira, for example, because you are, you are using for project management, I've forgotten. Uh, Asana. Uh, Asana. Yeah. Maybe could you share some benefits of using this, this tool um, for project <coughs> management? I think uh, why it wasn't Jira, for example, is that, uh, well, I think everybody has used Jira, so mm -hmm. more or less people know what it is. And uh, uh, we started this whole project with the pre-production phase where it was a small team and it was relatively straightforward and still to some extent 
pretty iterative uh, mm -hmm. during the production. And uh, for something like that, I think uh, Asana is simply out of the box beautiful because you can build tasks there in a super streamlined way, then you can start adding more parameters and make it more complicated as you go. Uh, and that was one of the things that we discussed when we were moving from pre-production to actual production, that do we need to change the tool into something you know more powerful. Uh, but we really didn't see the need, especially since the project management setup was so lean that there were one contact guy on our side, one contact guy on Wargaming side who were in daily communication and going through everything. So I think <laughs> with frequent FaceTime or frequent chatting in Slack or hanging on a phone, you can you can save a lot of a lot of effort on the process side and make it streamlined for the team and everybody working on the case. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So unfortunately, we have time for just one last question. But if you have further question for UC, you can contact him uh, later or speak to him later. So. Hi. Uh, so you, you mentioned that during production, uh, one of the ways to deal with this collaboration was to communicate progress. So my question to you is because you were doing iterative development, at what point did you know that you would be ready by s to soft launch at that date? How were you measuring progress towards that? Uh, the simple answer is that we had defined like the milestones and what needs to be in each of the milestones uh, before we started the production and we had like dates for each milestone. So that was basically super straightforward just to compare things against that. Uh, in terms of uh, more detail, like how do you know, I think that's something that when you are in the production stage and the game is becoming together and uh, in my opinion there really isn't any exact line when you can say that now this is ready for soft launch and now this is not ready for soft launch because in my opinion it's never too early to start collecting data and building the game with the data instead of just developing it blind. Uh, that becomes more like a, more like a mental decision uh, to some extent uh, as well. And I think those are things why it is super critical for these key stakeholders on both sides to meet frequently and talk about the project. And uh, of course, there's the technical talk where you go through the tasks and how everything is progressing. Are, are we in schedule or behind schedule? Uh, are we seeing too many bugs or does it look like it's in control and all these stiff stuff? But then it's also super important to go through those outside office hours activities together when, when the talk is more about, okay, we went through these topics today, how are we feeling about it? How, how does it look like? With next milestone, the, it looks like there's these and these challenges coming up. What if we don't succeed with them? Then how does it look like? Just keep that going on all the time and then people will really know uh, inside that, okay, now we're good to go. Thank you, I think that was the last one. Thank you all.